thank you for suggesting me for, I mean, it's a real honor to be a part of this amazing series that you have going on here. Some of the, the names of folks that you have, it's like, wow. Um, and I also just want to thank like Earl Brooks and everyone who is in the Sound Studies Working Group because um, I had such a great conversation with you guys today. And everyone at the Dresher Center, especially Courtney, um, for um, just making things great. So um, I just want to say too that like you're so lucky to have a humanities center. Like but a lot of the research I'm going to present today was uh, really facilitated by our humanities center at Miami University. And it, there, it's just an amazing resource. So please support the Dresher Center. It's really important. Okay, <clears throat> so I want to start this talk with a little anecdote that I uh, experienced recently when I was on my first family vacation since the shutdown era of COVID. And um, so we were on a Delta flight and there were, this flight attendant was coming down the aisle handing out earbuds and because I'm a sound nerd and like, a, you know, I just needed to see what these earbuds were all about. Um, and I'm glad I did because these earbuds kind of pers perfectly encapsulated what my past decade of research has been all about. So I want to show you the back side of the package first. Um, this side tells you about all the wonderful connectivity that these earbuds and a Wi-Fi connection can provide. This is the way we normally think about, uh, you know, basically media technologies, right? Both media scholars and lay people tend to think of media as technologies that inform, entertain, and generally facilitate communication. But if we flip the package over and look at the front side, um, I think, you know, maybe that'll, whoop, that'll be interesting because uh, what's on the front side of the, of the package should tell us what the folks at Delta really thought that these things were for, what these earphones are for. So let's take a look. <laughs> plug in and tune out, plug in, tune out. Delta knows that we don't really want to be on the plane at all. We want to be <laughs> at our destination. Um, the plane itself is acoustically noisy, um, but it also kind of feels noisy, right? Like we're rubbing up against all of these strangers and all kinds of social difference and physical difference that maybe we were not really thrilled about doing. Um, and so the question pops up, well, why would one of these notoriously stingy airlines care? You know, like why would they give us something for free? Well, like the other de airlines, Delta has long known that media can sort of counteract not only the acoustic noise of the airplane, but also our awareness of a shared social and physical space. Um, and also, you know, not to mention our anxiety about hurtling through the sky at hundreds of miles an hour, right? So this is why in-flight entertainment systems are almost as old as commercial flight itself. But plug in, tune out is ev even more important in our current era of you know, air rage and cultural conflict. If each one of us stays happily contained in our little sonic information bubble, there's probably less you know, chance of problems arising. But more broadly, plug in, tune out encapsulates the contribution that I've been trying to make as a media scholar. Using sound technologies as my primary case studies, I've shown that sometimes the primary purpose of information technologies is not to inform, entertain, or facilitate communication. Quite often, media's purpose is quite the opposite. But I didn't want to just merely point this out. I wanted to really understand the dream of canceling noise. And the more I learned about the history of this dream, the more I wanted to warn everyone of the danger that we might actually succeed. So let's first look a little more closely at the promise of noise cancellation and why it feels so salient today. And then let's consider what the emotional and political stakes are around this question. The emblematic technology of noise cancellation is noise canceling headphones. So here's a commercial about headphones that made quite a splash about a decade ago. Yeah, you can tell everybody Go ahead and 
hear what you want. Hear what you want was the tagline of Beats Electronics' hugely successful television ad campaign for their new noise-canceling headphones. In these spots, which first began airing in late 2013, star athletes are portrayed using smartphones and Beats Studio wireless noise-canceling headphones to shield themselves from the verbal abuse of opposing teams' fans or the insulting interrogations of reporters. Here, San Francisco 49ers quarterback Colin Kaepernick peacefully strides through a gauntlet of deranged, insult-hurling Seattle Seahawks fans outside their NFL stadium. Although he is walking through a near riot of hatred, all directed at him, he barely hears it, his face displaying an equanimity derived from noise cancellation and the ego-affirming sounds of Allo Black's song, I'm the Man. The Hear What You Want campaign, in the words of one reporter, went beyond marketing and actually became part of pop culture, generating millions of views online and sending Black Song to the top of the iTunes singles chart. Then in May of 2014, Apple acquired Beats Electronics for $3 billion, confirming the ascendancy of headphones in the global electronics space. Hear what you want crystallizes how noisy the world sounds and feels today. It would seem that like Kaepernick, people feel buffeted from all sides by sounds, voices, and information we don't want to hear. The 21st century has already seen a number of books with titles such as In Pursuit of Silence, Zero Decibels, The Quest for Absolute Silence, and even the rather resigned sounding One Square Inch of Silence? All of which attest to contemporary anxieties around noise, both as unwanted sound and as unwanted information. Newspapers and magazines feature stories like the one in Harper's Bazaar titled, How City Noise is Slowly Killing You. The New York Times tells us that New York received 420,000 noise complaints in 2016, more than double the number lodged five years earlier. An Atlantic piece investigated thousands of claims of wind turbine syndrome, panic and illness said to result from the low frequency noise of wind farms. Meanwhile, one of the biggest growth areas in audiology is the treatment of tinnitus, which is ringing or buzzing or other phantom sounds perceived in the head or ears, and hyperacusis, which is um, sort of a, a condition in which people become hypersensitive to noises around them, sometimes particular noises. In all of these examples, we hear listening becoming fatigued, beleaguered, hypersensitized, painful, even paranoid. But the noise crisis that I'm describing is not only acoustic or audiological. Listening also shows signs of strain in interpersonal and political communication. MIT psychologist Sherry Turkle says we're in the midst of a technology-enabled retreat from both conversation and from just being by ourselves. Rather than conversing or spending time alone, Turkle says, we increasingly spend our time, quote, alone together through the constant superficial contact of texting and social media. We enjoy this kind of mediated contact with others because like noise canceling headphones, these technologies help us control what we hear. They also seem to help control how other people hear us. My students often tell me that they prefer texting to talking on the phone because they don't have to talk in real time and they can more easily avoid saying the wrong thing. However, Turkle asserts that our, dev our devices also atrophy our ability to really listen to one another or even to listen to ourselves. On the political level, we hear similar claims about people's avoidance of noise. The left points to the propagandistic right-wing echo chambers of Fox News, Breitbart, QAnon, and talk radio, where conservatives can never have to hear facts about climate change, gun violence, racism, or who really won the last election. Meanwhile, the right points to college campuses, allegedly shielded by safe spaces and trigger warnings and bans on politically controversial speakers, so liberal snowflakes never have to hear anything that isn't politically correct. Of course, the purpose of many such accusations on the left and the right is really to just 
further convince one's own side that the other side is just making noise that doesn't need to be listened to. And yet, words can do harm. Psychological abuse is damaging. An assault on one's identity can be very painful. There's no responsibility to listen to those who make bad faith arguments, and there's no responsibility to listen to those who wish to hurt us with words. And we do live in a media world where this kind of noise abounds. The connective side of media has opened up new spaces and possibilities for all kinds of minoritized identities, but it has also opened up floodgates of reactionary backlash, making the plug-in, tune-out side of media feel very necessary. So noise can be personal, and tuning it out can be an act of self-care. The commercial for Beats headphones highlights this dimension of noise by portraying Kaepernick, an African-American, as the object of hatred for a majority white crowd. And as we all know, this turned out to be prophecy as Kaepernick's silent protest of the national anthem made him a hero to many black people and Democrats and a lightning rod for many white people and Republicans. So yes, the world seems to have gotten noisier for all of us, and yet how we perceive, experience, and define the problem of noise can be very different depending on our race, ethnicity, class, gender identity, religion, and so on. So this is actually a big problem with noise. Um, it's just kind of a, in some ways, useless concept. <laughs> it's just such an overloaded term that means so many things to so many different people in different contexts. And so, you know, as we'll see, noise can be a physical phenomenon, but it can also just be something subjective. Noise is also discursive, so meaning something that we kind of construct with words. So anthropologist Dave Novak points out that many languages don't even have a word meaning noise at all. It's just simply not a category of sound in some cultures. So the nature, perception, and definition of noise changes throughout history. And because of these problems with noise, as a scholar, I try never to use noise as an explanation for anything. Instead, I try to reverse engineer experiences of noise. Um, I, I want to figure out like, what are the material and social dynamics that create noisy experiences for specific people in specific settings at specific moments. So what I thought we could do is kind of just like jump around in history for a while and look at some of those specific histories of, of, or, or moments really to see what it is we talk about when we talk about noise. Krakatoa in 1883. The eruption of this volcanic island is said to be the loudest sound in human history. An explosive example of what we might call objective noise. One of the ways we can define objective acoustic noise is by amplitude. That is, some noises are noises because they're so loud that they are damaging to human health. They can disturb sleep, you know, harm the auditory system, even harm like the heart, harm the body. Um, so this is the kind of noise that we see regulated by cities and agencies like the EPA and OSHA. Before urbanization, there were probably not a lot of sounds of this type, right? This kind of noise. Um, maybe the odd thunderstorm or an earthquake or a volcanic eruption like Krakatoa. But with the Industrial Revolution, this kind of noise got amplified by orders of magnitude. So the invention and the refinement of the steam engine in the 1700s is tightly connected to the sort of uh, invention of the medical diagnosis of noise-induced hearing loss. In fact, at first it was called Boilermaker's disease. Boilermakers were these men who climbed inside the enormous steam boilers that powered the Industrial Revolution, and they banged in all of, all of those rivets that you see in there that held the boilers together. Blacksmiths had lost their hearing over time due to all their hammering, but boilermakers, I mean, what happened to their hearing was just horrendous. 
Um, it was just a degree of industrial hearing loss that had never been seen before. But if these workers suffered from the worst of the noise of industry, um, almost no one would escape it entirely. Steamships, railways, automobiles, propeller planes, jet engines, our new capabilities to travel at speed um, really raised noise, levelings at, noise levels at dizzying rates. In many ways, there's a direct and sometimes even exponential relationship between circulating goods and people at speed and the experience of noise. So for example, it's been found that merely doubling the velocity of an aircraft propeller's rotation created a 64-fold increase in noise. And of course, I don't have to tell you that the speed of the jet engine comes at a noisy cost. So interesting story about you know, this kind of aircraft noise. Amar Bose, inventor of noise-canceling headphones um, from, and, and the founder of the Bose Corporation, actually conceived of active noise cancellation while sitting on an airplane in 1979. The plane had a new technology by which you could listen to music through earphones that connected to the armrest of your seat. And I'm not going to like point anyone out, but some of us in here are old enough to remember these things. They looked like a doctor's stethoscope. They were terrible. <laughs> really not comfortable. Well, Bose was not impressed with these things. Um, he found that the noise, the objective noise of the aircraft um, actually caused him to have to turn up the sound, turn up the volume so loud that the classical music he was trying to listen to sounded like Metallica or something, right? It was just all distorted. So this is an experience of noise that Bose had that, um, and he, he responded, all I could think about was, my gosh, there must be some way of separating things that you don't want from things that you want. And that's when he took out a pen and paper and did the calculations that proved active noise cancellation was possible. The airplane would, re re the airplane would remain a constant in the first decades of the noise canceling headphones development and marketing. The earliest applications were for pilots two way headphones used for communication between the pilot and the ground. But then in the first decade of the 21st century, the first consumer versions of Bose headphones were marketed to business travelers with images of air travel as the main theme. Bose's innovation is called active noise reduction. The inside and the outside of the ear cups have tiny microphones that pick up the sounds of the world, replicate them, and then play them back 180 degrees out of phase. So the peaks of the original sound waves line up with the valleys of the mic'd sound waves and they cancel each other out. So I think you'll see that in a second here in this. There we go. So the noise gets turned on itself so that the peaks and valleys are like a mirror image. That's how your headphones work, or at least if you have noise canceling ones. So even when we're not listening to anything through noise canceling headphones, which a lot of people tell me they do, they just put them on just for the cancellation, the headphones still function as media, but they're media without content. Returning to the commercial we watched, what Kaepernick really mediates is not information, but his relations to the social and physical space around him, tuning out haters to achieve a form of sonic self-mastery, hearing what you want. The commercial reminds us that noise isn't only objective, noise can also be subjective, just a sound that someone somewhere doesn't like. Or in the words of Garrett Kaiser, noise is the unwanted sound of everything we want. <laughs> With this phrase, Kaiser emphasizes that noise is often an unintended consequence of something someone thinks is good and desirable, what economists call an externality. Now, I'm sure this kind of noise must have you know, existed to some degree um, in pre-agrarian and agrarian times but it really becomes commonplace with urbanization. But by urbanization, I don't really necessarily mean modernity. So for example, the Stoic philosopher Seneca, um, he, wrote that, uh, he wrote about this a couple of millennia ago. 
Seneca lived above a busy Roman bathhouse, which is sort of like hardly the sort of quiet, contemplative space that you might think about doing philosophy in. Um, but nevertheless, he claimed that he was unaffected by all the noise. Um, ever the good Stoic, Seneca claimed that a calm mind could withstand any noise, while an agitated mind would remain so, even in the most peaceful setting. He wrote, among the things which create a racket all around me without distracting me at all, I include the carriages hurrying by in the street, the, car the carpenter who works in the same block, a man in the neighborhood who saws, and this fellow tuning horns and flutes. I still find an intermittent noise more irritating than a continuous one, but by now I have so steeled myself against all of these things, for I force my mind to become self-absorbed and not let outside things distract it. There can be absolute bedlam without, so long as there is no commotion within. For what is the good of having silence throughout the neighborhood if one's emotions are in turmoil? Nevertheless, Seneca admits in this very same letter that his own stoicism was actually defeated by the cacophony of ancient Rome. My reader might ask, is this, this is all very well, but isn't it sometimes a lot simpler just to keep away from the din? I concede that, and in fact, it is the reason why I shall shortly be moving elsewhere. <laughs> what I wanted was to give myself a test and some practice. Why should I need to suffer the torture any longer than I want? And so it was that the great Stoic Seneca moved out to the Roman suburbs. And of course, he had the means to do so an example of an ancient association between quiet and privilege. But he was not the only ancient wise man to do this. Buddha, Lao Tzu, Jesus, Muhammad, they all retreated from the noise of everyday life to sow the seeds of their new religions and philosophies. And the ancient Greeks gave us one of our most potent symbols of how sound can capture our attention and threaten our autonomy, the sirens. As you may recall, the, silent, the sirens were these dangerous bird women whose hypnotic voices led sailors to their deserted island and certain death. Famously, Odysseus had himself tied to the mast and stuffed his sailors' ears with wax to resist the siren's fatal song. But in the epic tale of Jason and the Argonauts, we meet Orpheus, who is this sort of musical priest slash sensitive poet guy aboard the Argo. And when the Argo encountered the sirens, Orpheus played his lyre and sang his own counter song to protect his fellow Argonauts. In other words, he created a noise-canceling signal of sorts, or a wall of sound. In fighting sound waves with sound waves, Orpheus prefigures one of today's most common, yet least analyzed, media practices, masking or canceling unwanted sound in order to create a controlled environment and thereby control one's own attention and state of being. Technologies like those noise-canceling headphones that Colin Kaepernick wore. We often think that the past was quiet and the present noisy. I'm losing my microphone here, so I'm gonna... All right. Um, we often think that the past was quiet and the present noisy. But it's pretty clear that the, ur the urban ancients um, experienced a lot of subjective noise and had the same desire to hear what you want, as we saw portrayed in the commercial. We can also notice how in the myth, presumably invented by male poets, the threatening noise comes from an, an exotic, uncontrollable, dangerous other, the bird women. This reminds us of how our perception of subjective noise is always related to what kind of subject we perceive ourselves to be. Subjective noise is othered sound. It's sound that we can't or don't want to integrate into ourselves. So hearing what you want is an ancient dream, but a number of things had to happen in order for that dream to manifest itself in the form of technologies like noise-canceling headphones. In the modern era, noise would not only worsen as a problem, it would also become a new kind of object and a new kind of solution. In the 19th century, Hermann von Helmholtz 
delineated a difference between natural noises, such as surf or wind, and the sound of music. Noises, he wrote, are broadband sounds. That is, they cover many different frequencies, and their waveforms are irregular. Musical tones, on the other hand, are periodic. That is, they are composed of a limited set of sound waves that are regular and predictable with harmonic overtones. This discovery was one of the first of many new ways of objectifying noise, identifying it as a certain kind of observable pattern, a particular class of sound, not based on its volume, nor on the subjective quality of whether we like it or not, but rather based on the objective nature of the sound waves themselves. Modern science turned noise into a measurable type of stuff. And it even turned noise into a raw material that could be used to mask other noises. So masking is different from cancellation. By raising the noise floor around us, maskers reduce the audibility of other sounds. So if we look here um, at the first diagram on the left, that's a, that's a sound, OK? Um, it, we can look at it over a number of different frequencies. It's louder in some frequencies than it is in other frequencies. So let's say that's a sound we don't like. The second, the second um, diagram shows noise. You can see how this particular kind of noise has got pretty equal um, power along all of these frequencies, from the low frequencies on the left to the high frequencies on the right. So now if we put together the first sound with the noise, we can see that just the little top of the head of the sound we don't like is poking its head up above the noise. That's how masking works. So the relative volume, we don't perceive that other sound so much. We just hear the noise, and we don't mind the other sound so very much. OK, so um, this is the white noise and brown noise that individuals with ADHD tinnitus sufferers and creatives like Zadie Smith have touted as a salve for distracting sounds, racing thoughts, and ringing in the ears. The last time I checked, um, the hashtag brown noise had 119 million views on TikTok. Part of what I do in my book, Hush Media and Sonic Self-Control, is tell the 60-year history of how noise was domesticated as a technology of the self in this way. All right, so let's kind of regroup here, trace our steps. So far, we've discussed how urbanization made certain kinds of subjective noise more common, and modernity both raised the volume of objective noise and brought in new ways to objectify noise um, and quantify it and regulate it and domesticate it. But there were other factors that precipitated the crisis of listening that we experience today. So now I want to talk about those. Modernity also brought colonialism, migration, and urbanization at mass scale. The move from majority agrarian societies to majority urban, suburban, and exurban societies, spreading both objective noise and experiences of subjective noise, or othered sound, as people with different cultures of listening and sound making were put in close proxi proximity to one another. So let's look at an example of the experience of noise across cultural difference in a colonial setting. The talking drum was a commonplace mode of communication for hundreds, if not thousands of years in and among the rainforests of sub-Saharan Africa. In the rainforest, the wheel or the hoof is of no use for sending a message at speed. A smoke signal would not be visible. Talking drums brilliantly leverage the tonal quality of West African languages like Yoruba, in which the relative pitch of a spoken word affects its meaning. Talking drums have two different drum heads with different pitches. Thus, the combination of tone and rhythm allows the drummer to imitate the spoken word and transmit messages over six miles at the speed of sound. Until the invention of the telegraph, no culture on Earth had a faster or more efficient means of communication than West Africans. Talking drums may call to mind Morse code, but they're really quite different in the way they, that they imitate the sound of speech. 
And in order to prevent misunderstanding, the drummer needs to use these sort of stock poetic phrases. It's, it's kind of like the ancient Greek storytellers would use these stock phrases over and over again. Um, so, and then, and then they'll just repeat the phrase over and over again until the people far away can kind of get the point. So um, let's listen to what this sounds like. This is um, a video that was produced by the BBC and the excellent scholar David Hendy. So what does this have to do with noise? Well, I know this is gonna shock you, but despite the sophistication and poetry of the talking drum, European colonialists heard only noise. For literally hundreds of years, slave traders and missionaries failed to understand the complex messages that could be transmitted through talking drums. And this comes back to our earlier point about noise and identity. Because the Europeans didn't believe in the full and equal humanity of African people, they could only hear noise in African people's sounds. For hundreds of years, they found the sounds unpleasant and even threatening, never asking about their meaning. So this is a case of subjective noise being generated in an encounter between cultures where there was a meaningful message for West Africans, there was only threatening noise for Europeans. And in the southern United States, Euro-American enslavers passed laws against the playing of drums by enslaved people. An early example of how, in literary theorist Jennifer Stover's words, whiteness constitutes itself through sonic markers and sounded exclusions, what Stover calls the sonic color line. And I saw a poster, I know you had Jennifer Stover here. She's amazing. Um, of course, while, while all of that's true, one great animating contradiction of American culture is that white people eventually fell in love with the musical noise that they feared. And as American history unfolded, white listeners and musicians increasingly appreciated and appropriated the distinctive sounds that Trisha Rose has memorably called black noise, the sound ways of African descendants maintaining their cultural identity in the Americas through sound. Um, and Trisha Rose was speaking specifically about hip hop, but I'm kind of expanding it here. Um, you'll remember that Helmholtz told, uh, told us that the difference between noise and music is that noise is aperiodic or random in nature, a broadband sound that is not harmonic. While this sounds like an objective and scientific definition, there's actually a European cultural judgment about music that's embedded in this definition. And as one of my ethnomusicology teachers, the late Shizbi Maturi taught me, that in the West African musical aesthetics, a noisy buzz of the exact sort that Helmholtz describes is an essential element of the music. The music sounds kind of naked and plain without it. Um, and so, uh, for example, in Zimbabwe, the Mbira of the Shona people will have these bottle caps or other noisy resonators affixed to it to enhance the sound. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna play this for you, and um, oh, here's a, first of all, let me show you the, that's an Imbira, okay. Um, I'm gonna play a video, and you're gonna hear the musical notes that are coming from the tines that are being played with the thumb. Um, I actually studied playing this, but I, I'm terrible at it, so I, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I thought about bringing it, but I didn't want to subject you to this. So you'll hear some good players. But these, um, you'll also hear on top of the musical notes, the buzz of these bottle caps. Um, so let's see if you can hear it.
could just listen to that forever. But you can hear like the kind of white noise sound on top of the musical notes, right? Like it's kind of yeah, yeah, like a snare drum. Yeah. All right. So we can hear a similar noisy aesthetic in the raspy grain of the voice utilized in gospel, blues, jazz, funk, and rock singing, in the gritty sound of the saxophone, which was a novelty interest instrument in the US before black people turned it into a centerpiece of jazz, in the overdriven, distorted sound of the guitar amplifier, which became the basis of electric blues, rock and roll, heavy metal, punk rock, and so on, or in the scratch of the turntable and the bombastic noise of the 808 drum machine, two examples of how hip hop musicians repurposed musical technologies in noisy ways their original inventors could never have imagined. I can't think of a single type of popular music today that is not influenced by the aesthetics of black noise. Like colonialism, capitalism has also functioned as a noise generator. In its service, sound itself became a new kind of object, a commodity that could be bought, sold, and circulated in the form of phonograph records, radio, film, TV, tapes, CDs, MP3s, online streams, etc. The new diversity and reach of commodified sounds led to more experiences of subjective noise, as when you know, you're in your apartment and you're hearing your neighbor's uh, first-person shooter video game through the wall. But these technologies didn't just make the world noisier, they also changed us as listeners. As the historian Emily Thompson points out, media technologies and architectural enhancements turned us into consumers of sound. We developed taste, tastes in sound and very sophisticated ideas about what constitutes good sound and bad sound. And we got used to the idea that we should be able to control the sound around us, that we should be able to hear what we want. So this is a point I really want to emphasize here. Um, history is always changing us as listeners. And contemporary life has trained us to become more sensitive listeners in good ways and in bad ways. Um, all of the new forms of transportation and media that I've mentioned, as well as a 24-7 economy, these things sort of fragment our experience of physical space and speed up our experience of time. So our lives can feel very stressed and unsettled and alienated. And today we have a new kind of economy, an information economy, that offers unstable jobs and demands that we be better at paying attention and processing information just like a computer. But we still have these frail human brains that aren't actually that good at that sort of thing. Um, and at the same time, this information economy is generating more and more media distractions trying to monetize our attention, thus making our attention even more impossible to control. And this is the context in which noise has taken on an entirely new cultural meaning, one derived from Claude Shannon's information theory, which powers all of our computers. In Shannon's theory, noise is the opposite of information. Noise is the randomness from which any message must be made distinct. In the cybernetics of Norbert, Norbert Wiener, noise is chaos. Noise is the heat death of the universe. Noise is the thing that all life must resist through self-organization and control. In the information age, these concepts of noise have sort of trickled down into our everyday thinking, even if we don't know about Claude Shannon's theory. Um, I kind of call this way of thinking infocentrism. Like we kind of think that information is the center of life. We're told that information can be found in everything from our DNA to heavenly bodies. By 1984, the media scholar J. David Bolter wrote that the computer was giving us a new definition of the human as an information processor. And we hear this infocentrism every day when people speak about processing their emotions or when Elon Musk tweets that diseases such as the coronavirus amount to, quote, a software problem. In subtle and not so subtle ways, we think of ourselves as information processors and we think of noise as a threat to our, abil to our ability to thrive and survive. 
And this is the world in which we start finding sound and other people's voices truly intolerable. It's especially true of information workers, white collar workers, people in stressful open plan offices who have to concentrate. But instead of blaming our unsettled feeling on these histories that I've discussed, on the legacy of colonialism and capitalism and the unrelenting you know, competitive economic system that we all find ourselves in, we're encouraged instead to blame one another for being noisy and to purchase technologies to block one another out. So as usual, the free market steps in with a privatized solution to the shared social problem that, that it created. White noise generators, nature sound machines, relaxation apps, noise canceling headphones, and new in-ear computer technologies called hearables promise to perfect control over what you hear in the future. I call these devices Orphic Media because they are designed to fight sound with sound just as Orpheus did with the sirens. Until my book Hush, media scholars hadn't looked at any of this stuff because it's not designed to inform, entertain, or transmit messages, so they didn't really think of these technologies as media. But these technologies, I argued, reveal the essence of what we really use media for. The purpose of media is to manage how we affect our environment and how we are affected by our environment. And so I named this activity after Orpheus. I call it Orphic Mediation. Like Orpheus and the Argonauts or Colin Kaepernick, we all travel through a world of things and individuals that affect us. Attempting to navigate these sometimes rough seas and atmospheres, we use media to pursue what feels enlivening and enabling. And we use media to avoid what makes us feel diminished and disabled. In this way, we enact what the Chilean biologist Umberto Maturana and Francisco Varela call autopoiesis, self-creation and self-maintenance. It's like the way a single-celled organism moves towards a sensed food source and recoils from a perceived threat. We're evolutionarily more complex, of course, but we are still versions of these self-maintaining systems. This is what the concept of Orphic Media emphasizes, that through media, Yes, we use words and symbols and sounds and light and image and stories and news and our favorite songs, but ultimately, we do all of these things in service of maintaining our vitality. But as the, 19th, as the 17th century philosopher Baruch Spinoza pointed out, we're actually really bad at understanding what's affecting our ability to thrive. And unfortunately, as we use media to engage the world, many of our motivating feelings and beliefs about what empowers us and what disempowers us are what Spinoza called inadequate ideas, short-sighted, incomplete, and inaccurate ideas. And when we hold those kinds of ideas, that's when we use media in unethical ways. And we use media in ways that hurt others and hurt ourselves. Paired with plug in, tune out, um, Spinoza helps us make sense of the central problem of the internet age. We expected a global village because everyone would have more access to information. But instead, we learned that the more information was available, the more fragmented we became, losing any shared understanding of the world and amplifying enmity between those inhabiting increasingly differentiated datascapes. This is because information was never the point in our media use. The point was to feel whole and alive and to defend anything that threatens that feeling. But our inadequate ideas and the companies that cater to those inadequate ideas encourage us to think that our vitality will be found down the next conspiracy rabbit hole or in our custom TikTok feed, which provides our hours and hours of solitude 30 seconds at a time. And the algorithms are coming for our ears, too. Noise masking and cancellation are currently being supercharged by machine learning and the miniaturization of electronics. With machine learning, computers are starting to recognize the noise that we don't want to hear, sounds and even words that offend us. This could be the crying baby on a long flight or the nasty trolling of an anonymous competitor in online gaming. Miniaturization allows us to literally put computers in our ears 
computers capable of deploying the algorithms derived from machine learning. I do anticipate a future in which we will have extreme control over what we hear through these in-ear computers. And this is, a com this is a future that we've already been primed for. When Amar Bose said, my gosh, there must be some way of separating things you don't want from things that you want, he was talking about the physics of sound. But when his headphones were actually marketed to consumers, the sentiment was applied to our social identities. My historical research of Orphic Media has shown that these noise can controlling technologies are always marketed in terms of protecting a very deeply felt and individualized identity. So let me show you what I'm talking about. In the 1960s, white noise machines were marketed to white suburban housewives as technologies of domestic tranquility. In the 1970s and 80s, the Environments record series positioned itself as a calming but countercultural anti-Muzak for the hippie generation that was entering adulthood. When noise-canceling headphones first appeared in the 2000s, Bose marketed, marketed them to the upscale white business traveler. And then, a decade later, Beats marketed basically identical headphones as tools for people of cover, uh, as tools for people of color to survive systemic racism and microaggressions. So these are some images from the Beats campaign. But is hearing what we want really the future we want? One thing I've learned from my study of conditions like tinnitus and hyperacusis is that the more patients with these conditions use their earplugs and shy away from sound, the more sensitive and painful their hearing becomes. Could the same thing be happening to all of us in the realm of interpersonal and political communication? Could we be shying away from one another's noise too much with our noise-canceling headphones, algorithmic news feeds, and controlled lightweight contact through texting and social media. What do we lose when we gain so much control? A hot topic with my fellow professors uh, lately has been um, our belief that our most recent generation of students doesn't really want to talk in class as much as they used to. I don't know if, you, if that people say that here. Um, and I ask my students about this all the time, and, they, and some of them say they're afraid of saying the wrong thing, and, and I get that. I, I think I, that's definitely part of it. But I also think sometimes that they just don't get enough practice, right? Like we, we, we've kind of lost the opportunities to practice conversation with one another. Um, and I've had students tell me stories about like having a back and forth with someone on social media, friendly back and forth, and then seeing that same person in the hall and they just walk past each other without saying hi. And that just seems profoundly weird to me. I just don't get it. Uh, maybe someone can, can explain that to, to me. Um, okay, so I'm wrapping up here. As we've seen, we've entered a moment in history where guarding our listening feels more important than ever. And this is a valid feeling, particularly for people whose identities have been under assault. So I am not against the use of Orphic Media. I am for the thoughtful, mindful use of these technologies, however. Clinicians use a form of exposure therapy to retrain the listening of people with tinnitus and hyperacusis, which gradually allows the patients to engage with the sounds around them without so much pain and fear. Maybe we all need to do something similar when it comes to listening. Maybe we can spend more time reflecting upon our ideas about noise and our experience of noise of all kinds. Maybe we can challenge ourselves to experiment with listening to sounds and words we might reflexively avoid, react against, or simply disregard. Because if there is a potential for truth and reconciliation in our polarized country, it has to be found somewhere in the noise of others. Thanks. Those people who like has I, I, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll get rid of that terrible image. <laughs> no, 
So that might be triggering I somebody. I have rising <laughs> lights in my house that are like... It's, oh, yeah. You know, that's me, too. Yeah, oh, my God. I'm anyway, <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, the floor is open for questions. Yeah. Could you clarify on the, the screenshot that you had of the, the girl with TikTok where she said the brown noise and white... I don't understand the distinction between brown noise and white noise. Okay. So... Brown noise and white noise, um, there's a whole bunch of different colors of noise. And they all just have different characteristics of like which sets of frequencies are the loudest. But they all kind of have this shh sound. Brown noise has a mellower sound because it doesn't equally weight the higher frequencies. It kind of rolls off some of the high frequencies, so it has a mellower sound. And it's just recently become a a fad, to be honest. Um, there's nothing magic about brown noise. People are saying it does all these magical things. It just blocks out sound. And if you like it, that's, that's awesome. You should listen to it and whatever, you know, but there is a little bit of a fad going on right now with brown noise. Yeah. Um, this is something I've wondered for a while, but does active noise canceling actually protect from hearing loss? Or is it just adding more sound and just notice it? Yeah, I, I, that is a, you know, something that people feel nervous about. But I mean, you're perceiving it to be quieter, and it is quieter. Um, so I, I, it's not damaging. I mean, I could talk, I love talking about like hearing protection because I've got tinnitus. It's part of the way I got into this whole thing is because I used to play in bands and I, I didn't protect my hearing and everything and <laughs> um, but but basically it's all about volume times time so if you're listening to your headphones at the volume of just everyday speech that you would just do not kind of like the loud speech that I'm doing right now but just like a normal conversation you could probably wear your headphones for like I don't want to say a specific number, but for many hours and you'll be fine. Whereas if you're playing them really loud, um, then that window before you start doing damage is a, a lot shorter. So it's important to like rest your ears and to think about volume times time when it comes to strategies for protecting your hearing. Yeah. Thank you for this amazing talk. Oh, uh, thank I have you. so many questions, but I want to offer one personal anecdote and then follow up on my question. Yeah. Uh, so I grew up in China learning English uh, through all the times listening to Walkman, oh. and because the urban centers that I grew up in with so much noise, my hearing has been permanently damaged, I think. Oh, wow. Uh, uh, so uh, my question is actually kind of related to language because the example of uh, African drums uh -huh. suggests this kind of uh, possibility to uh, turn the language into noise. Um, and we probably have the experience, too, when we hear language that we don't speak, uh, that actually yeah. constitutes noise. Uh, but then there's also this other dimension of like learning language, uh, and then uh, that kind of um, the paradigm shifts a bit uh, between sound and noise. Um, and I um, recently watched a um, Chinese sci-fi film called Wandering Earth 2. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Depicting the future where people all have these uh, talking in space. They are speaking different languages, Russian, Chinese, and whatnot, but they're always hearing their own language already translated. So I guess the question is, uh, what do you see kind of the possibilities of that, like movement uh, between uh, turning the noise into actual language, uh, especially the bidding is the kind of futuristic um, narrative such as Wandering Earth. Yeah, uh, wow, I think that's such a great question. And it, it reminds me of like, I lived in Taiwan for a, a while, and I remember when I started to be able to understand the four tones of Mandarin, because the different pitches, uh, much like the Yoruba, like the different tones have different meanings. and. And that was just like, an, like, suddenly I could hear, not suddenly, it took time, but I could hear something that I couldn't hear before. Like it didn't, that just wasn't a feature of language, right? And for me, and then it was. And so then, then there was like this whole new level of, of new nuance and stuff like that. Um, what would be gained if um, we had the automatic translation of wandering earth? Um, that's a 
First of all, that, that's the science fiction writer Session uh, Liu. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, it's interesting, you know. Like I, I, I think, I think on the one hand, mutual understanding would be gained, but then on the other hand, the ability to start to think like the other is lost, right? Because when I, one of the things that kind of blew me away w was that um, I didn't realize that in English we attach gender to the third person pronouns, right? Like it, you're either defined by gender, and, and now we've, we're changing this and debating it, but he or she, right? But in Chinese, he, she, it were all the same. And that blew my mind. And I was like, and it seemed to me, from my perspective, kind of dehumanizing. And I was like, they're using the same pronoun for things and people? Like, like how is that? But then I started to think, why do we do that? Like, why, why does it have to be gendered? And then gender becomes the difference between a thing and a person in English. And so learning Chinese gave me that opportunity to question this, you know, very long ago. And then when the current debates came around about they and everything, I'm like, well, yeah, I'm ready. I want it, I want it to be more like Chinese because I think it's easier. It's actually more freedom of thought in that. Um, so, so yeah, I think there would be opportunity costs, even if we could communicate more easily. Jason. Um, well, no secret that I'm a huge fan of the book. Uh, love it. But I do want to push back on the main argument, um, not because I'm not convinced, but because maybe I, well, maybe I'm not convinced. So yeah. it seems like on the one, I mean, I guess I go back and forth. On the one hand, we have the argument you're making, which I think is is the the argument, the Enlightenment argument, the humanist argument, that right. if, it's, if we're going to survive, we're going to have to listen to each other. The other hand, we have this weaponization of trollishness yes. through media, yeah, and it feels like an arms race that, you know, I think about John Durham Peters talking about liberalism as this sort of like. Uh, machismo of endurance of, of that which is illiberal to prove one's liberalness, right? And it feels like, mm -hmm, uh, you know, uh, mm -hmm. what does he call it, like looking into the abyss, uh, courting the abyss, right? Yeah. So th I do feel like that is a, a tactic that is unequally, you know, the, the, the costs are unequally distributed among us, right? Absolutely. And there is a kind of you know, JDP-ish sort of liberal machismo built into this idea that if only we could listen more. Yeah. So I guess it's, I want to be like that, and I want that argument to be persuasive, but I feel so provoked. <laughs> I know, I know. It's it's a very, you know, especially as a white dude, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of not great argument to make. But the, the thing is, I think, I think people are generally, I mean, I, another danger is like, like this the whole neoliberal resilience discourse that Robin James talks about, this great philosopher who looks at pop music and she sort of points out that how all of these allegedly empowering songs for women are all about like just gritting your teeth and, and just bouncing back from all this horrible sexism and stuff and like not about addressing the structures that make that necessary, right? And, um, and so I, I, I hope I'm making a more nuanced argument than that, which is we don't have the responsibility to listen to words that are meant to harm. We don't have the responsibility to listen to bad faith arguments. Um, to the degree we could create algorithms to, to kind of filter that out, like the clearly ridiculous stuff, like that, I think that is probably really good. Um, but on the other hand, I do think that there is something about um, practice, getting, getting practice, and, and engaging with people, and engaging with things that maybe um, don't always feel great at first, right? Like a lot of things that, my wife is a, is a therapist, and so much of what she does with her clients is like get them to do things that don't feel great. I kind of, I'm kind of terrified of public speaking, to be honest, right? But, Thank God I forced myself to do it, right? Because it's like, 
it's been beneficial to my life. I've got to have conversations like these. So that's the piece that I'm, and it, and it is political too, because everything is, um, but I definitely don't want to make it simple or make some kind of libertarian argument, free speech absolutist argument, like I'm just not interested in all that at all. Thank you. Can I ask a kind of follow-up question to that? Yeah. Like, uh, I, I I take one sort of whole piece of the argument to be about this diversity of opinion, diversity of sound, diversity of, of uh, language, etc. cetera. Mm -hmm. um, that seems to me somewhat different from noise in the sort of physical sense. Mm -hmm. um, and at one point you said, you know, you're pointing out how things sound like noise until they don't, which I completely get as well and that maybe we don't, ha we don't need a category of noise or noise doesn't exist at some level, yeah. right? And then you recuperate the word noise. And you continue to use it in order to bolster this last thing, which is what sounds like noise is something we might maybe should listen to. Um, so I'm curious about that, that there seems to be a tension there. Yeah. And um, do we think there is actually something we're gonna call noise or is it all just culturally determined and you're saying like it's all relative and we should just recognize that? Yeah. So I, um, in the book, I really avoid noise a lot. Mm -hmm. And so, and, 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 and the theoretical paradigm of the book, I did not get into at all. For a, for a more public talk, I kind of want to use the language that people are using. But from, from my paradigm in the book, book is that I, I don't use noise as an analytic at all and instead I talk about the relationship between sound, physical space, self, and then sociality. And that those encounters, those encounters of those dimensions are productive of all kinds of things. And then that we've created technologies to control those relations. So if you um, Let's say, for example, you, you have tinnitus and you work in a library, okay? Tinnitus gets louder in a quiet space and it becomes less apparent in a noisy space. So if you're a librarian with tinnitus, your tinnitus gets louder merely by virtue of the space that you're in. So it's this emergent property, right? So some customer, um, and, and so, so, okay, so you're, you're in a quiet space, your tinnitus gets louder, that affects your sense of self, you start to feel anxious, start to feel like sort of discombobulated, stressed. Okay, so now self is being affected. So then some you know, library patron comes in and wants to ask you a complicated question and maybe you get very snippy with them or short with them because you're, you're just having a bad time. Now the social has been affected all based on this just contingent relation between sound, space, self, and sociality. And so is that, is that tinnitus a noise? Well, in common parlance, yeah, but that's not how I'm analyzing it. I'm instead of saying, like, the, instead of using noise, the noise of tinnitus as my means of analysis, I'm thinking about these emergent relations in, the, in this way. And that Orphic media would be, I put on a noise generator, it makes my tinnitus less ap apparent, like that graph showed, and suddenly my sense of self feels calmer, and then my social relation goes better with somebody, right? And so it's interesting that you can use a tool like a technology to kind of tweak these relations between these dimensions. That's really what the, the book's about, but I, I kind of, I don't know, I felt like that was a little technical. <laughs> okay, I appreciate that, yes. I, just, I don't know if that helps. Yeah, or... no, that, that, that's very helpful. Are there other? Yes, go ahead. I just want to have a comment about the Chinese language, the ta, ta, ta. Yeah. It's, um, it sounds the same. Oh, is it different? You write it out. Oh, it that's true, that's true. That It's gendered in the writing, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. There's one that looks male and one that, yeah, yeah. I shouldn't. Have, I shouldn't have. 
I was trying to portray China as a bastion of gender equity. <laughs> 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 Nowadays, uh, sometimes uh, in, in internet lingo, you will see yeah. people using T-A, which is the pinyin pronunciation. Yeah. Really? It sounds exactly the same. Yeah, so but when you write it out in Chinese. Yeah, yeah. that's a fair point. Yeah. So what I'm saying is uh, sometimes uh, young people especially would use the T-A spelling out as opposed to using the Chinese characters mm -hmm. to kind of make it more gender neutral. Uh, so that's also a new development. Wow, that's <laughs> so cool. I've learned something here. Yeah. Hmm. I think there's Sorry. one other question this one. No, no, no. It's a great point. It's a great point. Um, I have a couple of things that I've been trying to like formulate it into a question. I don't know if I can, but um, uh, with the like automatic translation thing, that makes me think of the babblefish. That's kind hmm. of the media that I'm more aware of. Yeah. Um, but it is interesting the way that uh, we have like. Like Google has like the automatic translate for written stuff. You know, it, we've almost gotten it to a point where you can do it in real time and just have like a little thing in your ear. Yeah. Um, but at that point, you are relying on whoever programmed that and whoever translated it originally. So we're missing out on that human like ability to make patterns out of things that a computer isn't going to recognize unless a human programmed it to. Um, so I thought that was really interesting. And then you mentioned the, um, the perception of time and when we're exposed to more, I guess, irregular noise and like fewer patterns like that, our sense of time is accelerated. Um, and it makes me wonder, I forgot where I, <laughs> that train of thought was going, but I just have a lot of, I want to know more about that. The, yeah, I mean, the, the point about, um, and thank you for the question. Um, I, th your, your point about the babblefish, yeah, yeah, you know, the, what kind of biases will be in that translation, you know, that, that, that's like yet to be determined, and, and, and I'm sure it's unfolding all the time for people who are using those kinds of technologies. Um, the time piece, was kind of about like the acceleration, the accelerated feeling um, that comes with the kind of modern capitalism that, that we have today. Um, and the feeling, the feeling that you need to be busy and, and, and be you know, efficient. And I, I was just listening to an interview with an author who just wrote a book about hanging out, saying that, like that's a lost, art like we we don't have <laughs> you know like the and she defined hanging out as like sort of like just literally having no goals but just being with your friends or, or something like that um, that there used to be plenty of opportunities for that and now it, it seems like we, we we're not very good at that anymore um, at least I, I think I, I would count myself in that number um, yeah, so that was what the time piece was about. And, th and that, that raises the anxiety and makes you want more control. You know, so then you can control, especially if you feel pressed for time, other people's noise really, like, I've got a deadline, I've got to get this done, I've got to write this talk. <laughs> you know, um, I don't have time to hear my, my kids, you know, playing downstairs or whatever, so I'll turn up my sound thing or whatever. relying more on technology to like create these boundaries that we would have to enforce ourselves which is kind of makes me wonder like what we're freeing like because the idea of technology is that we're freeing ourselves up to do more things but what what are we freeing ourselves up for what else are we because I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, the, you're, you're, it, it's, you're just right on it because, like, it, it, when I did the sort of ethnographic work to see how the people are using these things, it's for um, sleep 
and concentration and and relaxation and then and then the relaxation is because people are so stressed because all they do is sleep and concentrate on things or, or focus on things you know so um, and it's really interesting because the one um, example that's different is this series of records I mentioned called environments in the 1970s and they were using all these nature sounds in a really different way like he, he they did claim that they would make you read faster and stuff but they also claimed that they made sex better that it would make your plants grow faster like like all of these like very hippy dippy th ways of thinking and, and and it was all about a lot of it was about bringing people together through these nature sounds um they would be like these encounter groups like est i don't know if anyone remembers like that well, they would use these ocean sounds at the beginning of, of these groups where people would get together and confront one another in interesting ways and, and just have these, these communal experiences. So these technologies don't have to be used to silo us into these spaces. I'm not like a technological determinist. I just think it's those legacies that I've talked about of capitalism and, and colonialism have encouraged us to separate into these little spaces. One more question that I think kind of sums up my concerns, I guess. Is, yeah. Do you think that, um, you call it or, Orphic? Orphic, Orphic media, yeah. Do you think it's actually giving us more control? Or is it just making us think that we do? My, my kind of point is the more control you get, the more control you need. Because you get acclimated to that level. And this is what we see with the people who like try to defend against the, the, the noises because they, their, their ears are too sensitive. The more they do it, the more. And so my whole thing about let's try to listen, it's not, I, I just think people's lives will be less painful in the long run, even on an individual level, if they think about these things and don't just react. And then, yeah, the more control you feel like you have, it's almost like the more control somebody who's selling you that control has over you. So it's a little bit of an illusion, right? Like when I see my newsfeed and it's just telling me this stuff, it's like, yeah, you're right about politics. You're right about all this stuff. You're absolutely right. And it's stroking my ego. Like the more I need that, you know, and, and the least, less tolerant I am of, of other stuff because it feels good to feel like I'm in control and I'm right. And the same thing with conspiracy theories. Conspiracy theories give you the feeling that you know what's really going on and therefore you have more control than everybody else. Even if you have to believe in some kind of baby eating, you know, politicians and it's really scary stuff, at least you know about it. You know, um, and so you become the more you need control, the more controllable you actually are. Is my argument, or one of my arguments? Yeah. Hi, um, thank you so much. Really enjoyed the presentation. Thank you. Um, I particularly enjoyed the talking zone. Um, as an African scholar, um, I it was very interesting. Talk about the talking drums um, and the other instruments. Like, oh, the Imbira? Yeah. yeah. Um, and it was, that was also interesting as a medium of globalization scholar um, to see like the bottle caps, which are from like soda, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, how they eventually become. And in Kenya, we have something similar, so it was very interesting to see that. Um, but that's not even the question. Um, the question I want to ask is more in relation to the, the talking grounds and you talk about the colonial history yeah. um, of that um, yeah. and you know which eventually silences the talking grounds and I, I was thinking about the relationship between noise and protest um, mm. because I know the talking drums and um, other other instruments um, in various African countries um, that were actually used as a form of protest um, against colonialism, right? So, like the talking drums were a way to organize, yeah. right? For you know, like uh, guerrilla wars and that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, and 
so I want you guys, so I was wondering if, you know, that is something that uh, you looked at, the relationship between, not just in relation to the talking drugs, but just more generally speaking, noise and protest. Um. So when it comes to the talking drums, I should say that that is not like my original research. It, that, that's, I'm, I was getting, a, some of my examples I'm getting a little far afield from my own expert, area of expertise, but just for like a public talk, I thought they would be fun examples. So um, I have not um, studied that, that history very closely. Um, I do think, I have heard what, what you said. I don't know a whole lot about it, but I do think it's fascinating that the Europeans would have actually been putting themselves at greater risk by not listening and taking it seriously, right? So that it, it's, a, it's fascinating to think about in that way. Um, more generally, noise and, and protest, um, it's, it's not an area I've really done any specific research in. There are a lot of, a lot of good scholars who, who work on that space though, for sure. And, uh, and yeah, I mean, I mean, maybe like just thinking about um, the book I mentioned, it's really old now, but Trisha Rose, Black Noise, thinking about, about the role of hip hop in, as a kind of response to the, to the structures that people are in, a sonic, a sonic response, you know. Yeah, thanks for your question. Um, I think we're going to then thank you for a really wonderful talk and thank great you. conversation. And there's reception at the back, so if you've got a lingering converse, uh, question, please join us. Uh -huh. Thank you. That was really terrific.